Let me open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll go ahead and get started for today. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for today. Thank you for, even though it's cold and slippery out, we thank you for that, um, that it is warm inside and that you have blessed us with a place where we can come and get out of the elements. Um, we have so many things to be thankful and grateful for, and so Lord, we just stop and we give you thanks. Thank you for this day, for another day to, to live and to breathe and to, to lo- love you and to serve others. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, continue to open our eyes and our ears to teach us, help us to, to consider new things, new ways that we might uh, love you and serve you. Lord, I just pray that you just uh, go before us today and uh, keep us uh, in walking with you. Pray that you would be with us today during this chapel, that we would uh, engage with you, engage with um, new ideas. I pray that you would teach us something new about who you are and who you are calling us to be. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you that uh, you are with us here today. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so our chapel speaker today, his name is Jason Taves. I actually didn't ask you how to pronounce your last name. Is it Taves? Hey, yes, awesome. Uh, And so um, I want to, real quick before I introduce him, I want to tell you that today is part of a a Noctical Lecture series. And if you don't know what that is, come back tonight and find out. Uh, But tonight there is another uh, session. Uh, Jason's going to be talking again tonight at 7 p.m. here in the auditorium. And it's going to be a a great time. You're not going to want to miss it. And it will be worth community life credit. So if you want to get more credit, come back tonight and, uh, and participate in that. But Jason has built several, built, sold, and mentored companies across the globe. From Kansas farm kid to mathematician to technical founder, his keen eye for product innovation comes from his early days in making things work on the farm. Most recently, he was the CTO and co-founder of Quick spearheading engineering product teams and driving growth in their B2B um, program across 120 countries. Notable accomplishments include in, uh, integrate, uh, leading integration with major customers like Adobe and Blizzard. Uh, many of them, you probably have played or used their products before. And raising, o- <coughs> excuse me, raising over 250000 in grants for open source blockchain projects and being the pioneering force between, be, between, behind Quick's AI video <coughs> me, search technology. Wow. <coughs> Excuse me. Today he is focused on AI ethics and building deeper transparency into AI systems. Um, I had a wonderful visit with Jason just a couple weeks ago, and I'm excited for him to share with you um, all that he has been researching and thinking about. Um, And so would you please help me welcome Jason as he comes to share with you all today. Thank you. Well, that was a wonderful intro. Thank you so much. Good morning, Tabor College. Yay, that's great, almost awake. I'll tell you what, this brings back memories. Although the room is a lot bigger, I, wasn't, I was in the old building when I was here at Tabor, but I remember sitting in chapel up in the back somewhere with my hoodie on, and I had these cool little headphones, and the first 90 seconds were my decision of, am I going to listen to the speaker, or am I going to listen to music or a podcast? So I hope you'll join me this morning as I share something with you that's really near and dear to my heart. It's a personal journey that I've gone through, and it's something that I think about every single day, especially as a father with two little girls. I bet you haven't heard it in chapel before, and I'm sure you haven't heard it in church. Today I want to tell you my story about bringing back the dead. You'll see what that means in a little bit. And before we get into that, I want to share a little bit about what God's done in my life. Well, the intro um, that Ryan gave talked a little bit about it. Um, I grew up on a farm just 30 miles south of here in Whitewater. And uh, we were primarily a hay farm. So (laughs) there's a lot of throwing hay bales in the summer. um, But I still got to clean out my fair share of corn bins. 
And God, God brought me here to Tabor College um, through a wonderful journey of discovering my own faith in high school and then really capturing my attention uh, with mathematics. I was always kind of that tech nerd, the guy in high school who did the LAN party, set up all the computers, had everybody come over and throw Halo tournaments uh, when Halo 2 was <laughs> uh, back popular. I ended up marrying my high school sweetheart and uh, yeah, praise God, we have two little girls now and it's been a journey together because I was the ring by spring guy. Like, I got married while I was here at Tabor College. Um, then I started my first company and that was 14 years ago. Man, that makes me feel old. But then I learned about entrepreneurship after starting a company. So in total, I've started 46 products, nine became companies, I've exited two of them, four failed, and three are still operating today. As he said, I'm deeply passionate about AI ethics, so I serve as an AI consultant helping companies grow around the world while rediscovering their own human talent. And I feel extremely blessed to share this story with you today about resurrecting the dead and my own journey in that because it's taught me a lot about God in the process, even in just the last year. So let's get into the word of God. I want to read you the story of Cain and Abel. That's where we're going to start today. So if you have your Bibles or if you're on your phones, please turn to Genesis chapter 4. We're going to go through one, verse 1 through 17. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel in his offering, but for Cain in his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Then he built a city, and he called the name of the city after his son, Enoch. Man, what a beautiful story. There's a lot of firsts in this story, and you might think, Jason, why are we talking about murder is a beautiful story? <laughs> well, it tells us a lot about who God is. This isn't a story of why did God cherish Abel's offering over Cain's. This is much more than that. It highlights a lot of things. If you're an athlete, it shows that God doesn't require performance. 
Because remember, at this time, there was no commandment to make an offering to God yet. So Cain and Abel are bringing their fruits, the, the, the best of their talents, to God out of the willingness of their heart. And God has not required that yet. And yet he likes Abel's more than Cain's. Man, that's hard to wrestle with. But he does say to Cain, and this is the point of this entire story, which is you've got to be able to realize that to do what is right is what God is focused on. He tells Cain, look, I realize that you're angry. I see that your face has fallen, but sin is crouching at your door. What you do next is what's important. So there's some highlights because as we go through the story of Cain and Abel, there's a lot of stories I heard in Sunday school or like growing up as a kid that you kind of just hear and you wash over, right? You know, brother kills a brother, murder's bad, like let's move on. Um, But I want to kind of illustrate this story a little bit more as we talk about death. First of all, Cain's name in the Hebrew means to acquire, right? And in the Hebrew, when you named your child, it was the essence. It was like what their life was going to be about, the theme of their life and what they had to go through. So for Cain, it means to acquire. Okay, well, Cain's the farmer in this story, right? A farmer has to rely completely on the weather, the soil conditions, everything out of his control. He's got to rely on God to acquire a harvest, and a crop to bring to the Lord as an offering. Just think about that. God has provided everything for Cain to bring the offering. And then he says, I like your brothers better. (laughs) Oof. But God focuses on doing what's right. He focuses on helping Cain master sin. As an athlete or an academic, as you are in school, there's often times when you've got to push through that last late night study to master the content for a test or a quiz or a presentation. That was me last night, actually, for this. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was up pretty late working on this, but it's because I felt like there was more to write and more to tell. And as you're an athlete and you are mastering your body to perform on game day, it's so important to dial in everything from diet, food, rest. It all matters on game day. And that's what God is telling Cain. He says, Cain, what matters is what you do next. So Cain's legacy will be about how he acquires the things in his life. Does he give in to fear or does he rely on God? I like to wrestle with questions, so if you want to write papers on this uh, just because you're a glutton for punishment or you like writing, there's some big questions that I wrestle with in this story still, which is, you know, even though it doesn't explicitly say, why did God have no regard for Cain's offering? Why does God ask Cain where Abel is after he killed him? Doesn't he know? Like, God knows. And what's important about how God curses Cain? It sounds a lot like Adam's curse. How old were Cain and Abel when this story happened? There's no context there. Some people think there's actually like 50,000 people on the earth at this time. And the math works out. Um, But that's kind of odd to think about. Is it two like teenage brothers? Are they in their 40s? Are they in their 200s? Like how old are these guys, right? Yet at the, at the core of this story, it is still a story about God's character. We see his justice as he strips Cain of his talents. He was a master over the soil and exiles him to wander the earth. We see his mercy as he places a seal of protection on Cain from those who would avenge Abel. It's one of the biggest reasons people think Abel had family, siblings that would come after Cain and kill him. But this seal of protection, like that's a weird part of the story too. Like why does Cain get protection after he's murdered his brother? And I think it shows 
this character of God that meets us where we are and says, I know that humanity through the sin of Adam has changed its perspective on itself. There's shame, there's fear, there's, there's this new inward image that we cast on ourselves when we're separated from God. But God still is chasing after us. And his restraint is shown here in the extent of the curse that he gives to Cain and also gives him the rest of his life to repent and turn back to God's story if he chooses. We find a God who desires a deep relationship with each of us, no matter the sin, no matter the circumstance. We are all invited into relationship with him. I mean, in this case, God even told Cain what was about to happen, and he still disobeyed, and God continued to pursue him. This story is also significant because it's the first story of death. It's not a long life. It's not sickness. But it's the sin and wickedness of man taking the life of a brother. It's also the first time that blood is mentioned and the first time that a divine promise is mentioned in God's story. So what happens with Cain after this? Now, there's plenty to unpack in the murder of Abel, but I want to look at the story of Cain after he killed his brother. The consequence of Cain murdering Abel was a curse that stripped his talents, his gifts, his relationships, and they introduced something into Cain's life that he wasn't used to. This was lack. Now he lacked his skills, his talents, everything that he was good at, and he was disconnected from his people, right? So rightfully so, the family would have been fragmented, would have been separated to a great distance. But Cain goes and builds a city. That's, wow, okay, that's random. I mean, we're talking about the very beginning of man here. And Cain goes and builds a city. He just brute forces his way into creating technology. Cain is the father of technology in the Bible. Now, this is a big undertaking. In fact, if you continue reading, Cain's great, great, great grandson has three sons, and they all become the father of other things, tent making, stringed instruments and flutes, and also bronze and iron blacksmithing. So Cain's family line uses technology to overcome the lack that they find in their lives. And this is a theme that we're going to talk more about as we dive into how technology fills the lack in our lives today and the story of AI. Now, like many farm boys growing up, my brother and I, we love to follow dad around everywhere. And we would go help fix the combine. We would go ride in the combine. That was the better one. Um, we would learn about how to take care of animals. We would go and discover all of the things that we needed to be aware of. Because the farm is a very dangerous place. And dad was never afraid of standing out. In fact, he was a total goofball. He was the life of a party. He had a big deep, booming voice, and a larger-than-life personality that kept him <laughs> the center of attention often. He was 6'6", 320, and he was hard to miss. And then one day he was gone. It was a brain aneurysm while he's flying. crashed in a field not too far from our house. I was only 26. I was newly married, finding amazing success in my first company. I was working with clients overseas, I was traveling, and leading youth group at our local church. And there I found where my faith was made of, what my faith was made of. Was it just a childish belief? Was it something that I inherited from my parents? In that moment, being engulfed with grief, shock, 
being consumed with tears every night. I found hope in my memory of my dad. It was his own faith in Jesus and the assurance that God gives us through Christ. In the days afterwards, I I clung to the countless conversations that we had had, even if it was just the silly stuff, right? Like, Dad just couldn't work a phone, you know? He always was calling me and saying, Jason, can you help me figure out my iPhone? I'm trying to do this thing, download this app. Or maybe it was buying something on Amazon. That was a big endeavor for him to figure out. But even those little conversations and moments are precious to me. And through going, like going through all of his stuff after he passed away, we discovered hours of old cassette recordings. We looked at pictures. We read some letters that he wrote my mom when they were pen pals. And then life just went on. Days turned into months and months turned into years. And that's how it goes. Life continues. About a year after my dad died, I began working in the AI space. It's purely coincidental at the time. I had finally uh, decided to put that math degree to use. <laughs> uh, AI is quite math heavy, uh, especially back then. Our company uh, turned out to be an early pioneer using what was called machine learning, deep neural networks, to help automate video workflows. So a great example of this is actually... Um, the piece that we started with was taking candidate interviews. So if you're interviewing for a job and they ask you to do just a, a quick recording, hey, send us a couple minutes about yourself, tell us who you are, we could measure soft skills from that. We could determine how positive, articulate, confident, energetic you were. It's a really cool technology that I built with uh, one of my founders who came out of the HR space. So he knew the domain well, I could build the technology. And we took it out to the marketplace. But as entrepreneurship throws you monkey wrenches every single day, that pivoted a little bit. And it turned into a tool that automated captions on the bottom of videos. So if you see captions at the bottom of your social media videos, that's the kind of technology that we built. And as this technology progressed, I saw opportunities emerging in the space. There were new technologies to take text into voice applications where you could create realistic voices with large amounts of high quality audio recordings. We also started to see early applications of what everyone knows as ChatGPT today. Although it was quite unimpressive back then. (laughs) It was really bad. Um, But this space moves quickly. Now, let's pause for a second. If any of you are like, ah, maybe I've heard President Jansen talk about AI, maybe some of my friends have shown me ChatGPT, but what is artificial intelligence exactly? What is this stuff? Very simply, it's a machine that can perform complex tasks only humans have been able to do. What does that look like? Well, these are things like maybe tell an original joke and make somebody laugh respond to a complex topic with a nuanced and persuasive argument, find large patterns in data, and just simply describe it in normal English terms, not fancy graphs or... Or maybe it's holding an engaging conversation as if you were someone else. Hmm, that reminds me. Back to our story. Now, just like the rest of the world, over a year ago, I was blown away by the rapid improvements when ChatGPT3 hit the web. Quite frankly, I was kind of stunned for a week or two. It was so good compared to what we had seen and what we were used to. And it just so happened that I was exiting a company. So I had all the time in the world, all those pet projects that I had wanted to tinker around with. And one night, I, was, I, I remember rummaging through my drawer, and I found some of the old cassette tapes of dads. And thought hit me. I've got a four-year-old, two-year-old. These two little girls would love to hear a story that we read at night, but in my 
dad's voice and their grandpa's voice. They never got to meet him. We talk about him a lot. We get to go see the farm that he built. He's a deep part of our lives, but he's not a person to them. He's just an idea. So over the next week or so, I gathered all the information I could. All the recordings, everywhere, everywhere that I could find his voice, everywhere that I could grab his writing style. There were old emails, anything that I could find. And piece by piece, I built his voice. I built his style. And I found the story that I wanted him to read. Before I could press play, I didn't even know why I paused, to be honest. But in that moment, I realized I was bringing back the dead. And that's not what we're called to do. They had a word for this back in Bible times. It's called necromancy. Necromancy, the act of engaging, speaking with, or resurrecting the dead. And it feels like magic because it was magic. It is magic. It's something that we can't explain, this process that feels so real that we put it in the magic bucket. And in fact, there's a story about that. I'm going to read in 1 Samuel 28. We're going to look at a story of Saul at the end of his life. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. And Akish said to David, understand that you and your men are to go out with me in the army. David said to Akish, very well, you shall know what your servant can do. And Akish said to David, very well, I will make you a bodyguard for life. Now Samuel had died and all of Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums or the necromancers out of the land. The Philistines had assembled and came and encamped at Shinnom. And Saul gathered all of Israel and they encamped at Gilboa. So David's about to go to war with Saul. And Saul's getting a little afraid. And then when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. Sounds like fear, just like the story of Cain and Abel. Cain was afraid that his performance was not enough. And in that lack, he took his brother's life. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams, nor by Urim, or by prophets. Then Saul said, his, said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, a necromancer, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, here is the medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, and he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, Divine for me a spirit, and bring up to me whomever I shall name to you. And the woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done, for he has cut off the mediums and necromancers from the land. Why are you trying to lay a trap for my life and bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. And the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? He said, Bring Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You're Saul. The king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming out of the earth. He said to her, What is his appearance? She said, It's an old man. He's coming up, wrapped with robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he bowed with his face to the ground and paid homage. Then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warning, warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more. 
either by the prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you to tell me what I shall do. And Samuel said, Why then do you ask me? The Lord has turned from you and become your enemy. The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and you did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hands of the Philistines. Saul used a necromancer to fill a lack in his life. I faced the same choice, trying to bring a version of my dad back from the grave. Maybe an innocent approach. Perhaps even a joyful way for my kids to get to know their grandpa more. Through his big voice, his big personality, telling them their favorite story. Good intentions often pave the way to hell. Where does that road lead? It's not really my dad. Do I begin to hunger and thirst for more of that experience myself? Does that erode the very memories that I have of him that I hold so cherished now? Does it create a false reality for my kid? As I was preparing for this and I had that last question in my mind, it struck me how important this story of death is in God's story for us. Does death lose its significance in our lives if we numb ourselves with a technology that promises only something God has conquered? We're each going to be faced with the decision of how we treat death in our lives. Some of you may have experienced that with a loved one already, and all of us will experience death. We must remember the story of Cain. Do we focus our performance on our own abilities when we're afraid, or do we let our faith in God and the trust in his story for his people tell us how he treats death? There's a few verses in John that really describe the journey of death in its culmination in God's conquering of it. It's been a key part of humanity ever since Cain and Abel, and it was born out of the original sin from Adam and Eve in the garden. It's incredibly emotionally painful and hard to deal with, but it's been atoned by the blood of Jesus as part of God's divine promise to protect us and rescue us. We're coming full circle. It's the story of blood, the divine promise of protection. Jesus first showed us his power over death with Lazarus. You can read that story in John 11 sometime. He brought this man back from the dead, not as a shell, but as a whole man, return to his family. And then not long after, in John 20, we see Jesus' own resurrection in an empty tomb when death was completely conquered. In John 20, 13 through 17, Mary Magdalene is standing at the empty tomb and sees some angels. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. There's no concept for her that Jesus was actually alive again. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, If you have carried him away, just tell me where you have laid him. I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabbi. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, and to my God and to your God. As we close today, there's some of you who have experienced the same pain and lost someone very close. Let our hope be in Christ. As we go off and build the next world that we live in with new technologies that challenge us in new ways, that show us how our faith needs to step up and be responsible leaders in building God's kingdom, may we pause and ask the hard questions in the face of exciting and innovating technology. Like any good book, we all have a beginning and an end. And how we truly live without the bookend of death will determine what we pass to the next generation. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your story, the hope that you have given us in Jesus. I pray that you would guide us as we go out into the world and we lead your kingdom. God, encourage us daily to seek your face to understand that hard things are worth doing, that pain has been atoned for, God, that you are our Father that meets us where we are. Thank you so much for the story of Cain and Abel. I pray that it would be applied to our daily lives this week. In Jesus' name, amen.